We were talking about some of the early church fathers, the second century apologists, and some of the polemical fathers, and then we're moving into the third century fathers. In all of this, we are in a category of the church fathers known as the Antonicene fathers. The Antonicene fathers are those church fathers that came before the council of Nicaea. The patristic period, which is that period that we refer to as the period of the church fathers. The patristic period starts after the death of the apostles with the apostolic fathers, some of whom were actually contemporaries of the apostles, but we really think of the patristic period as starting with the death of the apostles, the last of whom was the apostle John, who died around the year 100 at the beginning of the reign of the Roman emperor Trajan. The Apostolic Fathers begin the period of the Church Fathers, the Patristic Period. The Patristic Period is uh, a little bit ambiguous as to when it ends, and different church historians and different scholars pick different points for the ending period of the Patristic Age. There would be some who would extend it all the way into the early medieval period. Uh, some have even extended it as far as the 12th century with Bernard of Clairvaux. I think that becomes a little unhelpful at that point if we're talking about church fathers in the period of the Crusades still. Uh, for our purposes in this class, we're going to limit our thinking of the church fathers to the first 500 years of church history. And I think that's a pretty safe way to encompass all of whom are really early Christian leaders and yet to still be helpful in terms of the way we think about church history. So the first 500 years of church history are what we are going to refer to as the patristic period of the church, the patristic age of the church. Uh, really we're going to go all the way up to 476 with the fall of the western half of the Roman Empire and that'll become more clear when we start to discuss the medieval period in this class. But uh, the first 500 years of church history. Within that first 500 years or that first quadrant of church history, we divide the church fathers into two primary groups, and they're divided based on the Council of Nicaea. The Council of Nicaea happens in 325. Those church fathers who are alive during the Council of Nicaea and then after the Council of Nicaea are known as Nicene and post-Nicene church fathers. The church fathers who lived and ministered before the Council of Nicaea are called Anta, with an E, Anti-Nicene Fathers, A-N-T-E, not anti-Nicene Fathers. They're not opposed to the Council of Nicaea. They come before the Council of Nicaea. Okay, so the Anti-Nicene Church Fathers, and that's the, the segment of church history that we've been concentrating on. Within those Anti-Nicene Church Fathers, we have the Apostolic Fathers, those who came immediately after the time of the Apostles. Then we have the Second Century Apologists. So we have some distinct groups within the Antonicene Church Fathers, but I don't want you to get confused and think that these are all separate categories. They are subcategories within the broader category of Antonicene Church Father. That's the umbrella, which is a subcategory within the larger patristic age, the first 500 years of church history. Okay, so maybe for those of you who prefer things that are more visual. If we have the day of Pentecost here in 30, and we go all the way up to the fall of Rome in 476, or roughly 0 to 500, this is the patristic age. This is one-fourth of the church history that we'll be covering over the two semesters. 325, we have the Council of Nicaea. And so... Nicene and post-Nicene Church Fathers, and then the Antonicene Church Fathers. So the A and F are the Antonicene Fathers, and then you have the P and, uh, or excuse me, the N and P and F over here, the Nicene and post-Nicene Church Fathers after the Council of Nicaea. So within this category, then we have the Apostolic Fathers, we have the Second Century Apologists, and we have other polemical fathers and other Antonicene Church Fathers. Okay, so most of what we'll be testing you on, pretty much all of what we'll be testing you on, is this period here. 
and we spend more time on the Antonicene period than we do on some of the other periods in this section of church history because it really is the foundational ground laying period of church history coming off of the teachings of the apostles, those earliest generations of Christian leaders. We uh, spent time on Tuesday talking about some of the second century apologists in particular. We were talking about Justin Martyr. We were talking about Tatian the Syrian. We were talking about Athenagoras of Athens. And then we came to talk about some other church leaders who are probably more broadly just labeled Antonicene fathers, but they are some of the more well-known of the Antonicene fathers. Clement of Alexandria and his student, Origen of Alexandria. And then a thousand miles to the west in Carthage, we have Tertullian of Carthage. And really a disciple of Tertullian's, a man named Cyprian of Carthage. And so we have these four very important African church leaders, two in the city of Alexandria in the east, two in the city of Carthage farther west. And they represent two very different approaches to the way in which they believe that Greco-Roman philosophy and culture ought to be integrated into the church. You have... Clement of Alexandria, who feels that as much as possible, Greco-Roman philosophy, Greek philosophy in particular, ought to be incorporated and utilized by the church for the purpose of evangelism. And Clement believes that Christianity is the truest philosophy, and therefore uh, we ought to harness the power of Plato and Aristotle and Socrates and others he saw them as lesser lights that pointed to ultimate truth, and that ultimate truth is realized finally and fully in the gospel of Jesus Christ. So in some ways, Clement believed that all truth is God's truth, to use kind of a modern take. And so insofar as Plato represented truth, that truth ought to be borrowed by Christians for the purpose of their apologetic. Tertullian of Carthage represented the opposite view. He believed that insofar as these Greek philosophers represented the wisdom of man, that the wisdom of man is always antithetical to the wisdom of God. In that sense, I agree with Tertullian because I think Paul makes that point explicit in 1 Corinthians 1 and 2. The wisdom of man is foolishness in the eyes of God just as the wisdom of God is foolishness in the eyes of the world. Tertullian represents something of a modern fundamentalist approach where he wants to separate Christianity from the culture as much as possible to make it distinct. And we talked a little bit on last week, we talked a little bit about how Tertullian raised that question, what has Athens to do with Jerusalem? What has the church to do with the academy? In other words, Greek philosophy shouldn't have anything to do with Christianity because it's actually antithetical to Christianity. There's nothing in Greek philosophy that Christians ought to use. This brings up, I think, the broader question of how should Christians think about philosophy? How should they think about secular learning? How should they think about secular culture? And those are discussions that are still going on in 21st century North American evangelicalism. Evangelicals in the broadest, most mainstream sense tend to be more, I think, in Clement of Alexandria's camp where they want to use anything and everything in the culture or in secular learning, secular philosophy, the secular academy. They want to incorporate that into their apologetic for making Christianity relevant to society. Modern day fundamentalism represents more of Tertullian's perspective that you want to separate as much as possible from secular society. And uh, maybe conservative evangelicalism stands somewhere in the middle saying we need to be separate and yet we also need to have a voice in the culture. We need to be in the world but not of the world. So it's interesting I think to recognize that these conversations are not something new that's hit, you know, the contextualization accommodation debate 
It's not something new that just hit the blogosphere five years ago. This is something that Christians have been discussing throughout the entire history of the church. Tertullian, as a result of these kinds of discussions, got more and more uh, antagonistic towards what he saw as worldliness creeping into the mainstream church. And his hard line position, his hard-nosed personality, led him ultimately to abandon the mainstream church and to join the Montanist movement. I was going to ask you guys what you thought of the reading that you did over the weekend from Brian Lipfin. I think you got a good sense of the contributions that Tertullian makes. Tertullian, known as the father of Latin theology, he's one of the first early church fathers to write in Latin. Most of the early church fathers before this time wrote in Greek, and the Eastern church fathers continue to write in Greek. The Western church fathers begin writing in Latin, and that's because Latin became the predominant language of the Western half of the Roman Empire, while Greek remained the dominant language of the Eastern half of the Roman Empire. So it wasn't that they were using Latin and Greek because they thought those were more spiritual. They were using those languages because those were the languages that were being spoken at that time. Now, of course, in Roman Catholic Western Church history, Latin essentially becomes sanctified in the eyes of the church because uh, they hold on to those ancient writings even at a time when Latin is no longer spoken in the West. But at this period of time, the only reason these church fathers are using these languages is because they're the languages that the people are speaking and using in the time period in which they live. So Tertullian uses Latin. Uh, you read from Lipfin that he probably was trained as a lawyer. We're not entirely sure, but the way that he writes uses a lot of legal language. Tertullian, in fact, invents terms from time to time to express theological truths. If the Latin language doesn't have a term available for him, Tertullian is not afraid to make one up. And he actually introduces hundreds of new terms into the Latin language. His Latin is among some of the most sophisticated and also some of the hardest to translate of all of the church fathers. One of the terms that he coins, which becomes very helpful for us, is of course the term Trinity, by which he expresses three persons in one Godhead, three persons, one God, a tri-unity, and that term expresses the biblical truth that you have three distinct divine persons and yet only one God. Tertullian, as you read, also was very helpful in some of the um, formal recognition, some of the process of the formal recognition of the canon, and that as you read, was largely in response to the writings of Marcion when Marcion began to cut books out of the Bible in order to support his very, um, very antagonistic form of Gnosticism, where he began to teach that the God of the Old Testament was a God of wrath and vengeance and only the God of the New Testament was a God of love and mercy. We talked about Marcion in a previous class. So Tertullian makes many helpful contributions, and in that sense, you got those positive uh, contributions from Lipfin. In that sense, Tertullian is a very notable and noble figure in church history. And yet, as Lipfin alluded to, there are really only two of these early church fathers who we talk about in this class who are not regarded as saints by the Roman Catholic Church. Now, we don't really care who the Roman Catholic Church regards as a saint and who they don't, but it is uh, informative uh, when we think about these early Christian leaders, why are Tertullian and Origen not regarded as saints? And the reason in Tertullian's case is because he joins the Montanist movement at the end of his life. He joined the Montanist movement because the Montanists represented a much stricter form of moral holiness. Uh, they had a much stricter moral code, and that appealed to Tertullian uh, because, again, he felt like the mainstream church was becoming way too worldly, not only in its philosophy, but also in the way that it interacted with Greco-Roman Hellenistic 
culture. Uh, Lipton kind of skipped over, I don't know if you noticed that, but he, Lipton, Lipton kind of just skipped over the fact that Tertullian became a Montanist at the end of his life. Uh, he, he mentions it really in the chapter with Perpetua. All of a sudden, Montanism is introduced, and he kind of just mentions, oh yeah, Tertullian was also a Montanist. Um, it's actually a pretty big deal uh, that Tertullian was a Montanist. Uh, Lipvin is, again, trying to put the best foot forward on each of these church fathers. And I think that's a helpful approach because too often in Protestant circles, we tend to just dismiss the church fathers because we think they don't have anything to contribute. And by putting their best foot forward, he reminds us that they did make important contributions and they are worth listening to. But the Montanism issue is a big issue and it's something that I don't think can just be overlooked. I'm not totally convinced by Litvin's argument in that chapter on Perpetua that the Montanism in North Africa was somehow a harmless version of the heretical movement that existed in Asia Minor. The Orthodox Church did not view it that way. They viewed the Montanism in North Africa as being as much of a problem as the Montanism in Asia Minor. So I'm not totally convinced but having said that, I think there is an explanation for why Tertullian defected. It was because he was so, so frustrated by what he saw as the integration of Greek society and worldliness into the church that it actually drove him to a place where he felt like uh, the moral code that he championed was finally being observed, and he found that in Montanism. That's not an excuse, but I think it is an explanation. All right, we're going to keep going, <clears throat> and I realize we're going quickly through these church fathers, but we have to make up a little bit of ground, and uh, this is being supplemented for you in the reading, so I, I feel like you're getting a fuller picture of the contribution made by these individuals. Irenaeus of Lyon, who actually predates Tertullian and also Clement of Alexandria. But I have him here because I have him categorized as one of the polemical fathers. Polemical meaning they dealt more with error and heresy within the church than they did with trying to make a defense of Christianity to those outside of the church. Irenaeus is one of the disciples of Polycarp. Polycarp was one of the disciples of the Apostle John. So we have, again, a connection straight back to the Apostle John in the writings and life of Irenaeus. Irenaeus, a bishop in modern-day France, what was then known as Gaul in Lyon, he aggressively attacked Gnosticism, in particular the Valentinian Gnosticism that you read about when you read about Irenaeus. We also read some of that from Lipfin's book. The Valentinian Gnostics with their aeons and their progressions of deities and these male-female divine pairs who then produced Mother Akamoth and she sinned and Sophia and, and the whole crazy uh, really pantheon of mystical levels of deification within Gnosticism. Of course, salvation not from sin, but salvation from this physical universe and ascension to a higher spiritual plane of existence. Irenaeus was the one who took on the Valentinian Gnostics, and he did that in his five-volume work against heresies. And uh, in doing that, he provides us with a lot of helpful information about that particular brand of Gnosticism. Also, a lot of helpful information about how, in particular, the Orthodox Church defended the faith against that kind of error. A few key quotes from Irenaeus. I like this one on the four Gospels. Uh, this is helpful because Irenaeus is telling us that the Church recognized only four Gospels. And he's writing very early, at just the very beginning to the midpoint of the second century. And uh, a lot of Gnostic Gospels were starting to be written around this time period. And yet Irenaeus makes it clear that the Orthodox true church had only and always recognized just four Gospels. What's funny though is the reason that Irenaeus gives 
It's probably not the reason that you and I would give, but in any case. He says, it is not possible that the Gospels can be either more or fewer in number than they are. There have to be only four of them. For since there are four zones of the world in which we live, in other words, north, south, east, and west, and four principal winds, while the church has been scattered throughout the world, and since the pillar and ground of the church is the Gospel and the spirit of life, it is fitting that she should have four pillars, breathing incorruption on every side and vivifying, making alive human afresh. From this fact, it is evident that the Logos, the fashioner Demiurgos, notice he's using the Gnostics' own terminology and turning it on its head against them, he that sits on the cherubim and holds all things together, when he was manifested to humanity, gave us the gospel under four forms, but bound together by one spirit. So four gospels, but one message. I just think it's funny that he ties that together to the compass and tries to use a compass to uh, defend the fourfold testimony of the gospel of Jesus Christ. On the witness of the apostles, he says, We have received the disposition of our salvation by no others, but those by whom the gospel came to us, which they then preached, and afterwards by God's will delivered to us in the scriptures to be the pillar and ground of our faith. Very important quote there because he is making it explicit that the oral preaching of the apostles was later written down and those apostolic writings, what we call the New Testament, are then the pillar and ground of the Christian faith. So Irenaeus makes the scriptures the pillar and ground of the Christian faith. Really an early statement of sola scriptura. Sola scriptura, of course, being a reformation uh, summary of the authority of Scripture. And then on the content of apostolic tradition, for those of you who maybe have interacted with Roman Catholics, and we'll talk about this a little bit more in a later lecture, Catholics often talk about an oral tradition that existed outside of the written tradition. And they'll say that there was a written tradition of the apostles, and then there was also an oral tradition of the apostles, and this oral tradition is where they get a lot of their practices that are not biblical. And then they'll say that the church is the authority over both the written tradition and the oral tradition. Well, when we look at the writings of the early church fathers, we find that there was an oral tradition that they sometimes refer to. It's helpful, though, for us to know what that oral tradition was. Lipvin talked a little bit about it when he talked about Tertullian's rule of faith. What was the rule of faith? Well, the rule of faith was was not something unbiblical, it was rather a summary of biblical doctrine. Same thing with the oral tradition. Here's Irenaeus telling us what the oral tradition consisted of. The ancient tradition of the apostles is, and here it is, believing in one God, the creator of heaven and earth, and all things therein by means of Christ Jesus, the Son of God, who because of his surpassing love towards his creation condescended to be born of a virgin, he himself uniting man through himself to God, and having suffered under Pontius Pilate and rising again and having been received up in splendor, shall come in glory, the Savior of those who are saved, the judge of those who are judged, and sending into eternal fire those who transform the truth and despise his father and his advent. There you go. There's the oral tradition of the apostles. All of that is found in the New Testament scriptures, which of course fits what Irenaeus said above, that the oral tradition of the apostles was written down in the New Testament. So from a Protestant perspective, the New Testament is the summary, and uh, maybe summary is not even the right word. It is the sum, better word. The New Testament is the sum of the oral tradition of the apostles. So was there an oral tradition? Yes, but it consists of and corresponds to the written tradition of the New Testament. Therefore, the New Testament represents both the oral tradition and the written tradition of the apostles. There is no extra tradition that has any authoritative weight. And uh, Irenaeus makes that point explicit. What I like about this, the ancient tradition of the apostles, you have to believe in one God, you have to believe in his son Jesus Christ, you have to believe in the virgin birth, 
You have to believe in the hypostatic union. Now, he doesn't articulate it that way because it won't be articulated that way until the Council of Chalcedon, but that he was 100% God and 100% man. You have to believe in his crucifixion. You have to believe in his resurrection. You have to believe in his ascension. You have to believe that he is the Savior and the judge. And you have to believe that he will come again. Well, those correspond almost exactly with the fundamentals of the faith that are articulated in the 19th century by the fundamentalist movement, out of which comes both evangelicalism and fundamentalism. Those are the same things that you and I believe today. So if that's the ancient tradition that's being discussed by the early church fathers, you and I would have no problem with that tradition whatsoever. Yeah, Matthew. I know it says the virgin, like could that be like something that they have used to say the perpetual virginity instead of just virginity in heaven Christ? Like could that be something that they could probably try and use? Or? Yeah, you're, the reference to the virgin here uh, is not at this point in church history an elevation of Mary. This is just a way of articulating that Christ was born of a particular virgin. It's a reference specifically to Mary in this passage. But it's not an elevation of Mary's status. That will happen later. The elevation of Mary, interestingly enough, I think really begins around the Council of Ephesus, which is in the early 5th century. It starts largely as a result of the introduction of paganism into Christianity after the Roman Empire becomes Christian. And uh, maybe I'll show you a blog post that I did on this a little while ago. Uh, John Calvin wrote a book called On Relics. It's a treatise on relics by John Calvin, where Calvin himself goes back into Roman Catholic history and traces the way in which the biblical heroes, biblical characters got elevated to the status of saints, and Mary, of course, gets elevated to the status of essentially a um, almost a deity. Uh, I, I would put, <laughs> I would, I would contend that Mary is treated as a deity in modern Roman Catholic and even some medieval Roman Catholic sources. Uh, the deification or the um, elevation of all of these different individuals takes place as a result of Roman paganism being integrated into Christianity at a time when everyone in the Roman Empire is required to become Christian. And Calvin traces the history of all this in his treatise on relics. And you can read the treatise, it's online. Um, by the time we come to the early 5th century, in 431 at the Council of Ephesus, we have a council where they're debating the Incarnation. And they're trying to safeguard the fact that when Jesus was born, he was born as both man and also as God. That he was God in human flesh from the moment of his conception all throughout his entire life. That there was never a time when he was not both fully God and fully man starting at the conception and moving forward. That's what they're defending. They're defending the Incarnation. As a result of that, they argue about the way that they ought to refer to Mary. Was Mary merely the bearer of man? Or was she the bearer of Christ? Or was she the bearer of God? So we're going to refer to her now, after the Council of Ephesus, as the bearer of God. Which initially wasn't supposed to be about Mary's status. It was supposed to be about the incarnation, that when Jesus was born... He was fully God. He had been fully God for all of eternity. He was fully God in his conception and his birth, and he remains fully God for all of eternity future. And in the incarnation, we have, the, the, we have God taking on human flesh. So Roman Catholics then, after the Council of Ephesus 431, start to refer to Mary as the mother of God. That's intended initially to be a defense of the Incarnation, but over time it becomes an elevation of the status of Mary. We have Jerome in the 5th century as well, starting to advocate the perpetual virginity of Mary, the Immaculate Conception 
of Christ. Uh, but it, it's all entirely unbiblical. We know from the Gospels that uh, Mary had other children, that Jesus had at least, well, we have four brothers that are mentioned, and the plural for sisters is used. So Jesus had a, four brothers and at least two sisters, which means he grew up in a household with at least seven kids, of which he was the oldest. So the, the whole thing is really the result of applying some of the uh, worship of pagan deities, female pagan deities, some of the things that they ascribed to Diana and to Artemis and to other of these Greco-Roman female deities suddenly get applied to Mary because pagans no longer have a pagan outlet for some of their pagan practices because they're forced to become Christians. That was a really long answer. Uh, but John Calvin articulates a lot of this in his treatise on relics. All right, let's skip over Hippolytus and go to Origen. Origen is the student of Clement of Alexandria. And Origen is arguably... If, uh, if Tertullian is perhaps the most articulate of all of the church fathers, Origen is probably considered the most brilliant of the church fathers, just in terms of his theological genius. But it is genius that is a two-edged sword. When Origen is right, Origen is brilliantly right. But when Origen is wrong, Origen is brilliantly wrong. Uh, no, he's... He's abysmally wrong. So he is uh, really, really bad when he's bad and really, really good when he's good. Which leaves us, as we evaluate his contribution to church history, um, kind of uh, where we're at with Tertullian and some of these others where we recognize that it's not full endorsement and full embrace of everything that he says, but we're treating him the same way that we would treat anybody else recognizing that he had flaws and failings, and we need to approach his work with a lot of discernment. Uh, Origen is considered to be kind of the father of systematic theology. His work on De Principis, the uh, principles, was one of the first attempts to systemize Christian doctrine. He was a prolific writer, Clement of Alexandria had been a teacher in a training school there in Alexandria, and Origen took over that training school after Clement. So he trained others. His hermeneutic, he was not the father of the allegorical hermeneutic, but he was certainly the popularizer of it. And that allegorical hermeneutic came to define the school of Alexandria. It becomes one of the two principal schools of influence in Roman Christianity in the centuries that follow. And when we read in Olson, you'll soon find that the allegorical school of Alexandria came into massive conflict with the literal school of Antioch. And those two m methods of interpretation come to define really the uh, post, the Nicene and post-Nicene period of the church in the Roman Empire actually becomes a, a massive issue in church history that you guys will read about as you continue reading in Olson. Uh, I wanted to read just a little bit from uh, Needham's book on Origen's allegorical hermeneutic. I know you read in Lipfin about Origen's allegorical hermeneutic, but I think it's helpful to read maybe a little bit different perspective. Uh, John Calvin, for example, considered Origen's allegorical hermeneutic to be what he called the root, I think he called it the root of all kinds of evil, and uh, talked about how Satan with his deepest subtlety had infiltrated the church with it. So from a Reformed perspective, Al Origen's allegorical hermeneutic is nothing but trouble. Certainly from our perspective here at TMS with the emphasis on the historical, grammatical, literal hermeneutic, we would see nothing good about the allegorical hermeneutic. Here's Needham's uh, discussion of it. 
here in this bottom paragraph, Origen was a controversial figure in his own lifetime and has continued to be so. On the one hand, few Christian leaders from the patristic age can compare with Origen for his noble, humble, gentle character or for his sheer depth and breadth of knowledge, both of Christian theology and pagan philosophy. On the one hand, Origen's own theology gave rise to the most fierce disputes. He claimed that the Bible alone not Plato or any pagan philosopher was inspired and that the Bible must be the basis for all Christian thinking. And I've got some great quotes from Origen that I'll share with you later where he really does affirm sola scriptura. But in fact, now in practice, (laughs) so he says that, but in practice, Platonism greatly shaped and colored Origen's whole outlook. When he interpreted the Bible, he said it had three levels of meaning, which he called the body, literal meaning, the soul, the moral or ethical meaning, and the spirit, the spiritual meaning. Well, isn't that nice? This scheme of interpretation sprang out of Origen's threefold view of human nature as body, soul, and spirit, a view which may itself be rooted in Platonic philosophy. Origen regarded the literal meaning of the Bible as less important than its moral and spiritual meaning. This enabled him to build up his own theology in a way that did not tie it too closely to a literal understanding of the text. So in other words, he could come up with anything he wanted to because he could make the Bible mean anything he wanted it to mean. Uh, Needham gives an example here, and I'll just read the example. The deeper meaning which Origen found in a text is usually called its allegorical meaning. An allegory is a statement or a story in which the words have two levels of meaning. So Lipfin kind of set you up for that by starting with C.S. Lewis. And so he's saying, hey, look, the same way you read the Chronicles of Narnia, that's the way you should read Origen. Except C.S. Lewis openly admitted that it was an allegory and didn't take it too seriously. He didn't derive doctrine from it. (laughs) An allegory is a statement or a story in which the words have two levels of meaning, the obvious meaning and the secret meaning. For example, I could say three men prepared a meal to feed their children. The obvious meaning is that three male human beings prepared some food to be eaten by their offspring. But I could also say that my statement has a secret allegorical meaning. The three men represent the Trinity, the meal represents the Lord's Supper, and the children represent the church. So the statement, the three men prepared a meal to feed their children, really means the three persons of the Trinity brought the Lord's Supper into being to nourish the church spiritually. And he's getting this example, I think, off of Origen's own writings. Origen tended to interpret the statements and stories of the Bible in this allegorical way. He did not ignore the obvious or literal meaning, but he saw the deeper allegorical meaning as more important. And here's the last paragraph. This way of interpreting the Bible was the method that Greek philosophers used to interpret the traditional stories of the pagan gods in Homer's Iliad and Odyssey. When the obvious literal meaning of a story seemed unworthy of belief, often because it was immoral, philosophers would seek a deeper and more spiritual meaning. Um, Origen was not the first one to do this. Really, the Jews of Alexandria, the Jewish scholars of Alexandria, had started to do this before the time of Christ. Alexandria was a place of higher learning in the ancient Roman world. And uh, the scholarship that was in vogue in that day was this allegorical interpretation. For the pagans, they'd read Homer's Iliad and Odyssey. The gods would do really immoral things, either of a violent or of a sexual nature, perhaps. And, of course, those things shouldn't be imitated. The pagan philosophers even had enough morality to realize that. So they allegorize the story to derive moral lessons from actually immoral accounts in these pagan stories. The Jews in Alexandria started to do that with the Old Testament. Suddenly you you could get around some of the difficult passages in the Old Testament by saying, well, maybe this story about all of the enemies of, of God being slain in a plague or being killed... Maybe this really is an allegory that teaches us a deeper spiritual moral lesson about good and evil. The Christians in Alexandria adopted this same perspective starting all the way back with Barnabas of Alexandria in the Epistle of Barnabas that we talked about earlier in this class. Clement of Alexandria did the same thing. He was the one that really tried to integrate 
Greek philosophy along with its allegorical interpretation into the church. Origen then followed in his footsteps. So Origen, he's the one that gets blamed for it all because he was the most popular of all of them. But he really inherited this method of interpretation from earlier Christians who inherited it from Jewish scholars who inherited it from Greek scholars in Alexandria, Egypt. It was the popular academic approach of the day. The result, though, is that Origen comes up with some really, really bad doctrines in certain places. Uh, among these bad doctrines is, of course, Origen's teaching of universalism, which recently came to the light again because of Rob Bell's book, Love Wins, where Rob Bell went back and found guys like Origen in church history who taught universalism and used it to justify his own teaching of universalism. Origen even taught that Satan himself would one day be saved. So it's pretty extreme. Like I said, when he's good, he's really good. And when he's bad, he's really bad. Lippin makes, like, for every one, uh, for, for five uh, admonitions of Origen's hermeneutic, you know, he, he loved Christ and he's, he was so creative uh, in finding Christ and this and that. And then, kind of as an afterthought, oh, yeah, and he could kind of come up with some other stuff. So. <laughs> Does Lipton not even does Lipton like what is what is what what's Lipton's view of being able to just come up with any interpretation that fancies you? Yeah, you're asking about Lipton's treatment of origin in this book, which is very uh, optimistic, um, very favorable, very kind. I think there's a I think there's a balance in the way that we understand these church fathers. I think we need to treat them with a great deal of patience and a great deal of respect and at the same time we evaluate their teachings against the authoritative measure of Scripture. And where they fall short of Scripture's clear teaching, we rise up and take a stand and say, no, that was wrong. And in Origen's case, some of the things that he taught that were wrong were really, really wrong. I don't think that Lipfin is... I don't think Lipfin is really treating those wrong areas with enough seriousness. I think he glosses over them. And I, I, I do think that he should have been a lot harder on both Tertullian and Origen. I don't think his attempt to justify the allegorical hermeneutic by saying, hey, it's just, it's just a Christ-centered hermeneutic, and, and who doesn't want that? I don't think that's an adequate defense, because I don't think there is an adequate defense. And um, when, we, uh, when we get to our discussion of eschatology, we'll, find, we'll see that Calvin, for example, strongly condemns the allegorical hermeneutic in origin. The problem is Calvin continues to apply an allegorical hermeneutic to prophetic passages in both the Old and New Testament and therefore justifies his amillennial conclusions. So the implications of this are far-reaching in church history and, and we still have people allegorizing the text today. But I don't think you can claim to honor the author of a text while simultaneously using the text in a way the author did not intend. So I don't think you can, on the one hand, say, I'm honoring Christ by finding Christ in this passage, if the word of Christ does not actually have Christ in that passage, in the way that Origen was doing it. Now, I think every text ultimately points to Christ, but you can't force Christ into every passage, if you understand what I'm saying. So I think that's one of the very major dangers of the allegorical hermeneutic. And I don't think Lipfin did a good job of pointing out those dangers. I think he glossed over it and uh, in a sense did a great disservice in the fact that he almost defended something that has had devastating results in church history. So, look, I think there's a lot we can appreciate from Origen. I want to be able to appreciate those things accurately and truly and affirm them wholeheartedly.
I can only do that if I'm being fair with the evidence, which means I also condemn the things that are not accurate and not helpful and that actually have uh, massive, create massive problems later in church history. One of the interesting things about Origen is that Origen himself is later deemed a heretic at the uh, first and second councils of Constantinople. Origen's followers, known as the Originists, um, are anathematized. And so you can see the Council of Constantinople in 545. Uh, this would, yeah, the, the Council of Constantinople in 545. If anyone does not anathematize Arius, Eunomius, Macedonius, Apollinaris, Nestorius, Eutychus, and we'll talk, some of those you recognize, some of you don't, but you'll recognize all of them by the time we get through the material. And Origen, as well as their impious writings, as also all other heretics already condemned and anathematized by the Holy Catholic and Apostolic Church and by the aforesaid four holy synods. And if anyone does not equally anathematize all those who have held and hold or who in their impiety persist in holding to the end the same opinion as those heretics, let him be anathema. So Origen is ultimately anathematized. There are some historians who think maybe it was Origen's followers who took his views farther than Origen himself intended, who are actually the ones being anathematized. But this is the reason Origen is not canonized as a saint by the Roman Catholic Church, because he was anathematized by one of their councils. So Tertullian is out because he joined the Montanists. Origen is out because he was actually condemned as a heretic. Gnostics in his day, and if he did, how would he, or did he distinguish himself from them? Uh, I see that he's looking for the hidden meaning behind Scripture, and they did the same, so I'm just curious about that. Uh, Origen would certainly have denounced much of Gnostic teaching, even though Gnosticism was also built on that Platonic dualism, which saw a distinction between the physical and the spiritual, and always treated the spiritual as having more weight and more value than the physical or the literal, in the case of interpretation. Uh, Origen did debate, uh, like for example, the pagan philosopher Celsus. He has a long diatribe against Celsus, where he defends Christianity against paganism. So he did play the part of an apologist in certain cases. And he would have denounced Gnosticism. The irony is that much of his own interpretive grid is built on some of the same presuppositions that led to Gnosticism also lead to the allegorical hermeneutic. It is that Greek dualism, or in Origen's case, is actually three layers, body, soul, and spirit, there's the literal meaning, the ethical meaning, and the spiritual meaning. And the spiritual meaning, of course, is the most favorable. The problem is the spiritual meaning is, because it's not explicit in the text, is always representative of the interpreter, not the actual intention of the text itself. So allegorical hermeneutics leads to people talking about whatever they want to talk about because... The interpretation is really, it's almost reader response. It's, uh, it's in the eyes of the interpreter. It's in entirely subjective. That Origen changed his mind before he died. On this view about those uh, uh, negative uh, doctrines that we have. Uh, to my knowledge, we don't have any record of Origen changing his mind per se, uh, not like we do with Augustine. Augustine, towards the end of his life, writes a whole set of retractions, and um, but we don't have those same. We don't have that same kind of evidence in written form, at least, with Origen. I'm sure he did at times change his mind on certain things. But I don't know that he ever changed his mind on, for example, his universalism. Certainly never changed his mind with regard to his allegorical hermeneutic. But one of the things, you know, it's a good question, Jim. One of the things you find with all of these church fathers is 
they're not always consistent with themselves. Uh, just, I think we can appreciate this in our own development of our own understanding that you don't, sometimes people's views on things change. And sometimes you'll quote from Augustine in his early life and he'll say something that sounds almost entirely the opposite later in his life and it's the same guy. So there's not a consistency necessarily, certainly not a consistency or a consensus among the different church fathers. They disagree with each other on all sorts of things. And sometimes they disagree with themselves uh, depending on the time in which they're writing. So we have to realize that these men are human beings. They're not inspired. They're not authoritative. And we treat them in the same way that we treat church leaders today. So... If I pick up a book by a well-known evangelical leader, I'll read it, I'll benefit from it, and yet if there's places where I disagree, I'll criticize it in those places, and I'll read it with an element of discernment because I recognize that it's edifying but not authoritative. That's how we ought to treat the church fathers. Yeah, because I was um, wondering, like in the book of Acts, that's why we call it the Acts of the Holy Spirit, but uh, can we say or conclude that the reason why they have those erroneous uh, doctrines is because they depend so much on their intellect than the Holy Spirit. So because I can't, uh, as I read those uh, background of, uh, let's say for the church father, most of them were really brilliant to the point that they left out maybe the, the illumination or the power of the Holy Spirit. Well, I mean, I think you're really asking a much bigger question about the role of the Holy Spirit in illumination. And for the sake of time, I'm going to, maybe we can talk more about that after class. But I see illumination as primarily having a moral import as the Holy Spirit leads believers to submit in obedience to the truth claims of Scripture more than it does necessarily an intellectual import in always helping Christian leaders getting every jot and tittle of their systematic theology 100% correct in all of the secondary and tertiary doctrines. Certainly the Holy Spirit confirms the true gospel in every true believer. But we are not at a time, when we're talking about the Acts of the Apostles, we're at a time where the Holy Spirit is inspiring people to write and to preach. When we're talking about church history, inspiration is no longer being applied. So it is providential preservation as these men live out the Christian life and teach and preach in much the same way that you men will live out the Christian life and teach and preach, recognizing that you won't, you won't maintain perfection in what you say or in how you live until you are glorified in heaven. So we're dealing with imperfect people. Insofar as they affirm the things that Scripture affirms, we should embrace them. But in places where they go astray from what Scripture teaches, we should reject those things. Applying the test of 1 Thessalonians 5, 20 and 21, that we um, affirm that which is good and we reject that which is evil. So, I think that's the way we ought to approach the church fathers. But to think of them as being inspired, it's, it's a, interesting you ask that question because the, um, the Greek Orthodox, Eastern Orthodox Church does believe that some of these church fathers were inspired and they treat their writings almost as if they are on par with Scripture. They certainly teach that the councils were inspired and that the miracle of Pentecost was relived at each of the seven major councils. That would be a wrong way of thinking about the church fathers. All right, guys, uh, Cyprian. We may have to save our test review until next time. That's okay. Um, <clears throat> Cyprian of Carthage. Cyprian was a bishop in Carthage during the Novatian Controversy. Remember the Novatian Controversy when Decius, the Roman emperor, came to power and he uh, persecuted the church really violently. And you had Christians who denied the faith, 
and they were known as the lapsed Christians, the lapsi as they were called. And after peace was restored to the church, they wanted to be forgiven and restored to full communion within the church. There was a group of Christians that wanted to just accept them all back uh, right away. There was a very strict group of Christians that did not want to accept them back at all. Those were the Novationists. And then there was the more moderate view of Cyprian who said, well, we will accept them back, but only after they have really demonstrated true repentance. And in some cases, only when they are right on the edge of death will they be restored into the Christian fellowship. So Cyprian's view was not just let everybody in uh, willy-nilly, but it was certainly not the hardline view of the Novationists that said, don't let anyone be forgiven. Cyprian took a view in which true repentance had to be demonstrated in order for Christians to be readmitted. And uh, this view comes to represent then the mainstream church's view. But uh, the reason Cyprian becomes important is because in the process of all of this, there were some rival groups that were set up in Carthage and even in Rome. Novatian in particular was set up as a rival bishop in Rome. And so there was a uh, split in the church. And Cyprian then did a lot of writing about unity in the church. And his writings on unity are intended to be understood in that context. When a rival church was established, claiming to be the pure church, the Novationists, Cyprian writes on church unity, in which he expressly, expressly condemns the division that is being caused by the Novationists over their unwillingness to forgive people who had denied Christ during persecution. So one of his key quotes, and this is a quote that sometimes will be used by Roman Catholics to try and make the claim that the Protestant Reformation was wrong and everything else. It brings up, of course, the bigger discussion of the importance of doctrine and the importance of unity. And we'll talk about that more next semester when we get into the fundamentalist evangelical discussion of the 20th century. There are in Scripture two principles that are both true and that need to be held in balance even though there are times in which there seems to be tension between these two truths. It happens a lot in Scripture where there's a seeming paradox. On the one hand, Christians are commanded to seek unity within the body of Christ. We are to be unified. We are to seek peace with one another. We are to not cause division. On the other hand, Christians are to maintain doctrinal purity. We are to pursue the truth. We are to recognize that love rejoices in the truth, and we are not to tolerate error or false teaching. So how do we hold those two truths together? Doctrinal purity and unity. Those are two principles that we are to embrace. Cyprian <coughs> emphasized unity, but he emphasized unity in the context of doctrinal purity. And uh, in that sense, I think presents a helpful pattern that true unity is unity that finds its foundation in doctrinal purity. Doctrinal purity, if you don't have doctrinal purity, you can't have true unity because... At that point, it becomes only a superficial form of unity, which is not what the Bible is, it's not what the New Testament espouses. But we'll, we'll have more of that discussion next semester when we talk about it within the context of 20th century American Christianity. Unity versus purity. Purity must always come first. Purity is the basis for unity. If you don't have doctrinal purity, you can't have unity at all. On the flip side, we need to be careful to make sure that we are taking the commands in the New Testament for unity seriously and not dividing ourselves unnecessarily from others over issues that are not related to core doctrinal tenets.
All right, regarding the, necess- uh, the necessity to be part of the church, Cyprian said this, He can no longer have God for his father who has not the church for his mother. He who gathers elsewhere than in the church scatters the church of Christ. There is no other home to believers but the one church. Now that's in the context of this novationist heresy and Cyprian saying, look, you can't go with the heretic novation and still be part of the true church. And if you leave, you give evidence of the fact that you're not truly a Christian. Regarding the division caused by novation, Cyprian said, since the church alone has the living water and power of baptizing and cleansing man, he who says that anyone can be baptized and sanctified by novation must first show and teach that novation is in the church or presides over the church. Now, interestingly, Cyprian taught that you, your baptism, in order to be legitimate, could only take place within the true Orthodox Church. That's not the view that the mainstream church itself came to adopt. They actually taught that if you were baptized in a schismatic church, a Novationist church, or later a Donatist church, that that baptism still counted if then you repented and joined the mainstream church. So Cyprian was a a little bit different than um, the mainstream church on that particular point. But I think understanding the things that Cyprian says, it becomes very, very important to understand the context in which he was writing. Uh, I have a chart here in the notes. This is kind of rudimentary. It probably could be filled out a lot more, but I think it's helpful to see some of the connections between the apostles and then the apostolic fathers and then the disciples of the apostolic fathers in the apologists and in others all the way up to some of the men that we've been talking about, Clement, Origen, Tertullian, and Cyprian. And you can see, again, that 2 Timothy 2.2 principle being worked out, that it's apostles teach Timothy and those like him, trust these things to faithful men who will then teach others also. We see that fourfold model lived out in church history. Um, I have some questions for evaluating the second and third century church fathers. I'm going to skip over some of these, but what would we be willing to die for or to fight for? How do we assess the spiritual condition of some of these men? What warnings do we take from these men? Uh, I think we've talked about all of those things as we've discussed these individuals. And then finally, we only have three minutes left, so we're going to have to save our study review time until test review time until next class period but I have an addendum here from Fox's Book of Martyrs. Fox's Book of Martyrs in the history of English Christian literature Fox's Book of Martyrs is one of the three most important English Christian books ever written one of the three most popular English Christian books ever written. Number one of course would be the King James Version of the Bible which is the most influential English piece of literature ever penned or translated. Then you have secondly Pilgrim's Progress and thirdly Fox's Book of Martyrs. Fox goes through some of the early Christian leaders and gives us an account of at least according to church tradition how they died and I've put arrows next to some of the more important and uh, you should go through and at least read the paragraphs where I've put the arrows. So we have Timothy here, and then Ignatius, page 77, and then Polycarp, and Justin Martyr, and then a little bit farther down, Irenaeus, and a little bit farther down we have, there it is, Origen. I think you read in Lipvin, I think Lipvin includes the story about how Origen tried to go with his father to be martyred and his mom prevented him by hiding his clothes. Kind of a funny story from church history. Then we have Cyprian who was martyred by the sword. And then, uh, I don't know if I have any other ones marked or not. All the way to Constantine who of course 
Constantine becomes the emperor who legalizes Christianity and ends these periods of persecution.